Hey friends, Kevin Schmidlin here, host and producer of Philly Who. And by now, you know me quite a bit, but I feel like I don't know anything about you. It's been roughly eight months now since the show started, and I'd like to learn more about you, the listener, and about how I can make the show better. Also, candidly, I'm exploring ways to support the show since it's still just me in this one-man operation, and though Philly cost of living is great, I do have a mortgage to pay. So, if you'd like to help me and the show grow bigger and better than it currently is, please consider taking the audience survey I've put together that can be found in the show notes and at podphillywho.com forward slash survey. Everyone who takes the survey will be entered to win a $25 Lockaloom gift card and their choice of Philly Who swag, including a snapback a beanie or a t-shirt check out podphillywho.com forward slash shop to see the options if you answer all the questions it'll take about 10 minutes but that 10 minutes will go such a long way in helping me develop the show further and while i have you i might as well expand my holiday wish list to ask you to make sure you're subscribed and if you really dig the show help spread the word on social or just by sharing it with one friend it really does help so to all listening at the time of release, I hope you have a relaxing and reflective holiday season. And to everyone else hearing this, thanks for tuning in and please take that survey. You're listening to Philly Who, the podcast that tells the stories of the doers, thinkers, and performers of Philadelphia. My name is Kevin Schmidlin, and today I'm talking with Jane Golden. Jane is the executive director of Mural Arts Philadelphia, the nation's largest public art program that employs over 300 artists annually. Over the past 30 years, Jane has led Mural Arts to become an internationally renowned program that has made Philadelphia one of the mural capitals of the world. In this episode, you'll hear how Jane got her start as a mural artist while living in L.A. after college and how she made waves fast by asking forgiveness rather than permission. And this man gets out of a very fancy car and he's like in a suit and he goes, are you Jane Golden? And now I'm really beginning to panic. He said, um, I own this building. So I look down where the man is who signed my form and he goes, Jane. He's the tenant. After a surprise lupus diagnosis, she came to a graffiti-ridden Philadelphia for treatment. Here, she stayed in the public art space and got involved in the anti-graffiti network. And my assignment was to recruit graffiti writers to sign up for anti-graffiti and then to try to rechannel the negative energy to something positive. What follows is the story of how Jane and her team grew mural arts into a world-class program that has made Philly an international mural destination. We're gonna go with the speed of light. We're gonna open up our doors to all kids, not just graffiti writers, because all kids deserve access to art. And slowly, strategically, we started to build up the mural arts program. Stay tuned to Philly Who. So if you're listening to this while anywhere within Philly city limits, you could probably take a look at the block surrounding you and see the work of mural arts. Whether a portrait of a historic figure, an abstract statement on a social issue, or even a diagram of a particularly special football play, odds are you're within a few hundred feet of a mural. And for someone like me who's only been in Philly for around 10 years, this is just a normal part of Philly life. I've never known a Philly that isn't blanketed in beautiful, larger-than-life works of art. But, of course, that wasn't always the case. As recently as 30 years ago, Philly wasn't coated in murals, but was covered in graffiti. And while graffiti is its own form of art, it's also vandalism and a crime. And studies prove that the overwhelming presence of graffiti causes higher rates of more violent and harmful crime, which was already pervasive in urban environments in the 80s and 90s. So, in 1984, Mayor Wilson Good and the city created the Anti-Graffiti Network to combat the spread of graffiti. It was in those early days that the Anti-Graffiti Network and their young, socially conscious artist, Jane Golden, adopted the strategy of harnessing this urban, often anti-establishment energy and pointing it towards artwork that celebrates and enhances a neighborhood rather than defaces it. This strategy would prove so successful and beneficial to Philly communities that in 1991, Philadelphia was awarded the Innovations in American Government Award. 
Since then, this program has grown to completely transform Philly into a living, city-wide art gallery that attracts artists and visitors from all over the world. And to this day, Jane Golden is still leading the charge and consistently reinventing herself and the program. She's now spent more than half of her life running mural arts here in Philly, but as you'll hear, she was an artist from the very start as she grew up in a small, quaint town of Margate on the Jersey Shore. Our house was about 50 feet from the beach, and you know, Margate used to be sort of a sleepy beach town, and it was really, really empty fall and winter and spring, and that's when I loved it the most. And uh, I would walk on the beach all the time. On Saturdays, we would ride our bikes to Longport and we'd go to the point. That's where the ocean and the bay meet. And it was all sand dunes. And so that was really great. And we belonged to a swim club at the Traymore Hotel on the boardwalk. And we had a great spy club. I was like the head of a spy club. Spy club? What, <laughs> yeah, like a spy, you know, like 007, James Bond. Well, <laughs> so what does one do in a spy you, club? You investigate. You were looking for like crimes to solve, wow. even though we were like eight. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> and so I, we would make notes about strange occurrences. We would keep journals. It was a great old hotel with like a thousand rooms. What? We would look at the beautiful murals in the ballrooms. There was tea and cookies every day at four. So we'd, get, we'd like wow. raid the cookies. No, I was like, <laughs> I was a kid who loved reading detective stories, Nancy yeah. Drew, every spy book, mystery book I read. So I like lived that. <laughs> My sisters used to go out in the backyard for hours and they would say, let's go play spies. So I can't wait to share that with them. Yeah, you because- should tell them if fellows thy here. But when we would go around when I was little in the classroom and the teachers would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would always say a detective. <laughs> a detective. Wow. So yeah. do you still read mystery novels? Oh, yeah, I read mysteries all the time. Oh, I wonderful. love mysteries. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> so then uh, eventually you would go to, this is a total fast forward, but you would attend Stanford. Yes. So- Why did you go to Stanford? Obviously, it's a wonderful school, but it was a school at the time that um, had a really wonderful art program and that they were looking for serious art students. And people said, this is something that's just not known about Stanford. And, you know, if you're a really serious artist, that would really help in your application. So I was able to go out there with my parents and apply and show my portfolio and I was, you know, you can't help but be taken by Stanford's campus. It's so beautiful. And, but I really felt it was a huge stretch that I wouldn't get in. And then um, I did get in and lo and behold, it was an amazing experience. And in the art classes, there were only like seven or eight students. It wasn't a ton of students. And I just couldn't believe how privileged I was to be able to go there. And we would go to San Francisco to the artist studios for class sometimes. And really well-known California painters would talk uh, to our classes. They also had a great, great art history department and a really good um, political science department. I took a lot of political science classes. I was double major political science and fine art because I thought about, in the very back of my mind, I thought about law school, but I was also an artist. So that was pretty primary for me. So at that point, you knew full well that you wanted to be a professional artist. I did. I was nervous about it just because I thought, well, how do professional artists like make money? What do they do? And I, you know, you're young. So you think, well, I'll, I'll deal with that at another time. But then, you know, I was graduating and my painting professors were really clear and they were like, look, you should get a studio. You should try to get a job that won't take away from your creative impulse and concentrate on painting. And I just felt like, oh, that's so precarious because it's like, you know, one has to make money. So how how is this going to play out? So I did take their advice. I moved to LA. I got a job that was really boring. I was, it was pretty miserable. I forget what I was doing. And I got a studio in Santa Monica and I was painting. I was painting. I was quite a prolific painter. And when I went around LA, I saw these amazing murals everywhere. It was really hard to miss them because LA was the center of the mural universe back then. But I really felt very isolated, alone. I mean, granted, I was new to LA. You know, I'd get on one freeway, I'd get lost, I'd get on another freeway. I I just couldn't understand LA. It was so mysterious to me. And But these murals sort of grounded Los Angeles for me in a way that was really interesting. And I grew up with parents who talked a lot about the work created in this country during the 1930s. So during the Works Progress Administration, fabulous murals were created. So I would say I'm from a mural-friendly family and that I really looked at these strong images as a child and as a high school student. So when I got to LA, the murals meant something to me. I connected visually and emotionally with them. So what types of things at that point in your studio were you painting? I saw myself as a social realist painter. So I painted a lot about topics. At that point, there were a lot of articles about the LAP 
PD. And so some of my paintings were about police brutality, just life in cities. I went back in my memory and painted actually about time I spent in New York. So then I would also be looking at sort of the expressionists, the German expressionists. I looked at the painters from the 1930s. So if you looked at my work, it was like slightly abstracted, but really strong figurative work. Yeah. And then at what point did you start actually painting murals yourself? You know, one day I was reading the LA Times and I saw an, an article that was about the LA mural program. And I was like, oh my God, there's an organized effort to do murals in LA. And the article said they gave out 10 grants a year to artists. So I applied and well, I called them up and they said, you're past the deadline, you should come back next year. So I was like, okay, but let's take a hypothetical case and say, I wasn't past the deadline. What would I have to do? They said, oh, you have to find a wall. You have to get do a design about a community issue. You have to hire people from your neighborhood. So after I hung up, I decided that I would just do everything anyway. So I researched the area, found out there had been a wonderful pier and that the city had torn it down and people were very sad that this pier was torn down. So I thought, oh, it reminded me a little bit of Atlantic City, this pier, when I looked at pictures. So I, I did this design. And then I walked around the neighborhood and I just introduced myself to people and I said, what if I did a mural in the neighborhood? And they're like, oh, that would be good. And then I walked down the street and I saw this great wall on a building right at the corner of Ocean Park and Main Street, which was one of the main intersections you go through if you're in Santa Monica going to the beach. It was a very prominent intersection. So I knocked on this door and this guy answered and there was like a paper mache cow outside that said, love animals, don't eat them. And I'm like, oh, I'm a vegetarian. This is really great news. I'll bond with whoever this is. So this guy comes out and I said, oh, hello, my name's Jane Golden. I would really love to do a mural on your wall. So he's like, okay. So I was like, no, I'm really serious. And he goes, well, that's fine. So I said, well, do you want to see slides of my work? And he goes, not really. So I said, you're just going to let me, a stranger, do a mural on your wall? And he goes, that's right. So I was like, okay, this is odd, but hey, people do seem very friendly in LA. So I took out a little piece of paper I wrote, and I said, would you sign my piece of paper? And it said, I, Ronnie Bruce, give Jane Golden permission to do a mural. So I was like, thanks. And he goes, sure, whatever. So then I went home. I'm like, I can't believe it. I have permission to do this mural. So then I went around my neighborhood again. I asked people if they'd work with me and sign my petition that they would work with me. So they said, yes. So I had my packet of info. So I called back the city of LA, the mural program, and I go, oh, I did everything you said. Would you reconsider an application from me? How much time had passed now? Not long, just like weeks. You, okay, so, so it didn't I flew really take, action. you I just, went right for yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. So they're like, what don't you understand? You were like past the deadline two weeks ago. You're still past the deadline. Like, this is like, just like sort of go away. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, fine. So I hang up and then I drove downtown. I dropped off all the information like at their office. Yeah. And then like, I called them every day for like months, like literally every day, like three o'clock I go, it's time to call the LA mural program. And finally in December, I got a phone call and I heard someone say, is Jane Golden there? And I'm like, this is she. And they said, well, we hope we never hear from you again. And I said, who's this? And they said, this is the LA mural program. And then I'm like, oh my God, they hate me. And they said, you have the grant. And they sort of yelled it at me. You have the grant. I'm like, ah. And the grant was like $300 to do a wall 20 feet high and 100 feet long. And I was like, oh my God, I've never done murals because I was disingenuous on my application. I said I'd done murals all right. over Stanford's campus. So then my friend said, oh, you have to call the city of Chicago. They have a mural manual they could send you and that will teach you how to do a mural. So I ordered it. I still have it on my bookshelf. It's all underlined. So it's like, do a grid, transfer inch to foot. So anyway, so we started doing this mural and it was like this amazing experience because all these people started talking to us about community issues, neighborhood concerns, like strangers were coming up to us and going, this is so beautiful. We love it. I don't think it was like that beautiful, but I mean, it was striking. I had a great team of all women I was working with and um, it was like a really thrilling experience. Wow. So then... The, I'm guessing the mural was a great success. People were so thrilled because it was like recreating history in a city where people felt there wasn't a value placed on history and memory. So that was exciting. And when I was standing there on that corner, like for me, it was like, oh, I get why murals are important. They make art accessible to everyone. Like I knew it intellectually, but being on the corner reinforced all of that for me. So it's like my love of mural making started back then. And then it's funny, about halfway through the project, there was a big article in the LA Times about the project. And this man gets out of a very fancy car and he's like in a suit and he goes, he, he's very serious. He goes, are you Jane Golden? And this is while you're painting? Yeah, while I'm painting, I'm up on the scaffolding. He goes, I read the article in the paper, but he's still frowning. I said, oh, is everything okay? And he goes, um, 
my name is Herb Bolger. So I look at him, I go, oh, it's nice to meet you. He goes, that name is not familiar to you, is it? So I said, no. And now I'm really beginning to panic because he's so serious. He said, um, I own this building. So I look down at the corner where the man is who signed my form. And he goes, Jane, he's the tenant. <laughs> and I'm like, right, there is a difference. And I'm like, do you like the mural? And he goes, I love it. I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> oh, my God. Thank you. So he allowed it to stay. Yes. <laughs> And then after it was finished, then people said, oh, you should get a celebrity to dedicate it. And I'm like, hmm, I'm 22 from New Jersey. I don't know anybody famous. And so my colleague said, well, Jane Fonda lives down the street. So I'm like, really? So I went down the street. I'm totally covered in paint. I knocked on her door and she answered. Jane Fonda answered. And I was like, hello, my name's Jane Golden. And she goes, I know who you are. She goes, I've been watching all of you paint. I'd love to see young women at work. I've seen you all pushing the scaffolding and lifting the paint. What do you need me to do? So I said, would you cut the ribbon in our mural dedication? She said, yes. And is there anything else I could do? And now I joke with my colleagues here. I would ask for a donation. Yeah. Then I just said, you could bring friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she did. She brought tons of friends. It was fun. It was like a thousand people showed up. We had bands. We had food. But I think the big thing for me is I fell in love with mural painting. And then I ended up painting murals in LA for a number of years, working with kids on probation. Loved it, loved it, loved it. And then sometimes when your life is going very well, something happens and suddenly I was struck down. I became very, very ill and I was diagnosed with lupus and told I would not live long. And I ended up coming back East um, for treatments. Wow. So, I mean, when you got that diagnosis, how did that change your outlook? Well, when you're young, you don't really think about your mortality, right? I mean, for me, I, I'm going to live to be 100. And also, I want to say that my life was so privileged, right? Like, I, you always sort of get your way in some way. I think, you know, not that I always got my way, but I feel like life had been sort of charmed. Yeah, you, you find until it. Until it's not, right. And so I realized that I needed to try to figure out, because the doctors were pretty despairing. So I had to figure out how could I meet people who were not and so some nurses were much more optimistic and they gave me really good advice how you have to become, like sort of make peace with an illness, learn from it, get perspective, be tenacious about trying to get better, like with the willpower I had to really think about getting better. So I came back east and I was coming up to Hahnemann Hospital for treatments. That's where my lupus doctor was initially. And when I was coming up for treatments, I started reading the Philadelphia Inquirer, and I read that Philly had a new mayor, our first black mayor, Wilson Good, and that I read that he was starting this anti-graffiti network where he was going to work with kids who were graffiti writers, and in one of the articles it said he was going to start an art program. And so I went home, and I wrote Wilson Good a letter, and I just said, I would truly be honored to work in your administration, and I'm attaching my resume for your review. And a few weeks after I sent it, I got a call from the man who was head of arts and culture, Oliver Franklin, who invited me to come up for an interview. He knew the woman who gave me my first grant in Los Angeles. Oh, wow. And Judy Baca said to him, Jane Golden will drive you crazy and you should hire her. <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible. And I'm like, that's fair yes. on both counts. <laughs> so can you describe the Philly that you moved back to at this time? What was it like? I mean, it was such a different city. I mean, it was... You know, this is pre-gentrification. But there was one thing that was like so stirring and moving. And like I'd never really experienced this before because I, I hadn't really lived in a city. So I met block captains and neighborhood leaders and heads of community groups and activists and organizers and people who were so committed to life in that neighborhood and who, quite frankly, were moving the boulder up the mountain with very little resources, but a lot of will and tenacity and belief. And that was so inspiring. And my colleagues at the Anti-Graffiti Network were mostly community organizers. And so what I want to say about Anti-Graffiti is there are three things. One, it was a really amazing program, and I give a lot of credit to Wilson Good and Tim Spencer. And they committed city dollars six million dollars was close to that to working with young people most of the money went for jobs so truly the seat of power was open to kids from every neighborhood of the city and i felt like wilson good really wanted to work in communities and neighborhoods that had been underserved by government and that was a very serious commitment so that was exciting the second thing is you know the fact that a big city mayor 
valued art. I could see that graffiti writers liked art. And so he wanted to put that at the center of what he was doing was really incredible. And the third big thing is that, you know, I am a white person who's from New Jersey, who spent time in California, who did not know Philadelphia. There is no way on this planet that I could have really understood Philadelphia or had access without the anti-graffiti network. So who we are today is completely connected to who we were and where we come from. So what were you doing then at first with the anti-graffiti network? I was hired to be like an art coordinator. They weren't really sure. Like I barely had, my title changed a lot. I didn't have a desk. That was odd. The city gave me an undercover police car that was completely dented when you beeped the horn, the trunk flew open. That was mysterious too. And my assignment was to recruit graffiti writers to sign up for anti-graffiti and then to try to rechannel the negative energy to something positive. That was part of my little job description. Wow. But graffiti writers were coming, like tons of them, to sign up for anti-graffiti. Not because they loved anti-graffiti, because they really didn't, but many of them wanted jobs. And that was our carrot. So you had to do scrub time and pay your dues, and then you were sent to either one of the community organizers, they were called field representatives, or me. And most of the kids liked art, and so they came to me. So I very quickly had to figure out a plan. So I went to community centers, I went to recreation centers, I went to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I asked if I could teach. I emphasized former graffiti writers. They all had to take a pledge where they swore they'd never write on walls forever. I have a great photograph of the kids with Wilson Good because they do that quarterly looking miserable. Um, And then they came to me and I was like, yikes. So none of them wanted to use a paintbrush, but there was a mandate we couldn't use spray. So I had to try to say to them, listen, you all are good at spray paint. Yeah, I can't teach you anything about that, but we can paint murals. And I would show them mural books from LA, Chicago, San Francisco. And I was like, and we can go to the museums. They loved abstract expressionism. I'm like, look, and, and they had an uncanny knowledge of abstract expressionism as if they graduated from college, but many of them had dropped out of high school. And I would say over and over again, look, you've dropped out of high school. Like, where do you think you're going to be when you're 25? And first they were like, we're going to be famous like Keith Haring or, you know, Futura. But I'm like, look, only a handful of artists make it in America every year who can rely solely on their work. So try to, you know, use anti-graffiti to be resilient, you know, to be like tough, to stand up to the art world. If your work is in one year and out, so what? Because you have so many other things you've developed. That was our obligation to kids. Were there any particular artists that stick out looking back that may have been especially hard to convince but wound up being very successful in the program? Oh, they're not a few. They're like a hundred. I would say that Teddy Harris, who used to write Knife, is you know a well-known poet now. Uh, Rocco Albano, who wrote Pez, is he's a senior vice president at a big digital marketing firm. Uh, Steve Powers, who wrote Espo, is a well-known artist in New York. I mean, and I like, I'm so proud of all the young men and women that I work with because they were very d- determined and um, our common ground was our mutual love of art. I just instinctively felt they would be good mural painters because they were good wall hunters. They liked heights. They liked working out in the weather. I'm like, you guys are going to love murals and you love art. So, you know, I went to my former boss and Wilson Good and said, look, I'd like to introduce, I know I was hired to run art programs. I'd like to introduce mural making into the mix. And they were like, yeah, that's fine. And so we did. And then that just started a movement here in the city. Wow. So at that point, did you, could you even have imagined then that the movement would be where it is now? No way. No, no, not, not at all. I think the whole time I was in anti-graffiti, I kept thinking eventually this program is going to shut down. Yeah. Eventually I'll go to law school. You know, Once all the graffiti is gone, what are we going to do? Yeah, you know? I mean, I felt really, I love the job a lot and I love the work with communities and with young people. I mean, it was just an amazing opportunity. And I think that's where I learned everything I know about community organizing came from anti-graffiti, about valuing the authorship of community, really listening to people, not making assumptions, you know, knowing that you don't have all the answers, looking at Philadelphia as a city that is filled with people with assets and gifts and there are opportunities everywhere. If we, you know, as part of the the power structure are able to sort of provide an equitable framework for people. So this whole time, did the murals that were commissioned and eventually created, did they all have those ties into either social issues or justice or just neighborhood issues? Well, a lot, but also some were just about beauty. I mean, some were waterfalls or forests or, you know, like, I mean, 
people were clamoring for just something beautiful. And then the mural became like a catalyst for other kinds of changes. So then the ground in front of the mural got turned into a garden and people called about other city services. And then we started programs. I mean, we were very intentional about how we operated. So you really saw the mural as a force for good. You know, I'm not going to be disingenuous and say, oh, it's a panacea for everything cities struggle with. Obviously not. But because we were part of government, because we could deliver other services, because we had an educational program, we could come in a multifaceted way and really partner with the community to make changes happen. It was really, I mean, it was thrilling. That's amazing. And I built bonds with people all over the city who really, quite frankly, became like family members to me. So as the program grew, at what point did you realize that it wasn't going to just shut down and you weren't going to just go to law school? I think I always thought I might go to law school. Do you think you're still going to go to law school? (laughs) I still think that. No, I think that in 97, when anti-graffiti closed down, I did apply to law school, right? And I'm here because my brother talked me out of it. He's a lawyer and he said, I don't think you should go to law school. And I was like, what? I said, what do you think I should do? And he goes, you should run an art program for the city. I said, well, there isn't one. I mean, other than like the art commissioner, 1% for art. So he said, well, go start one. Go talk to Ed Randell. So I did. I went to see Ed Randell and, you know, thank goodness for Ed Randell. He, I told him the idea and he said, well, I think you've done great work at the Anti-Graffiti Network and where in city government would you want to be? Because Anti-Graffiti, when Tim Spencer passed away, was being restructured anyway. And I said, well, I'd really love to work for Michael DiBerardinas because he was the recreation commissioner. And we wrote up a little proposal. We went to him and he said, okay, come up with a name for yourselves. We said the mural arts program. He said, Jane Golden, you're in charge. We were like in charge of all. And we had a teeny little budget. It was me and like five of the former graffiti writers and Dietrich Adonis, who was a former teacher. Mike didn't have a place for us. So they gave us, We were, they used to be in the Phoenix, that fancy building, the Phoenix. So they gave us an empty floor, what? the whole fifth floor. floor, the whole floor. And artists love empty floors. Like for yeah. us, it was like awesome. Clean so, slate. It's yeah. a blank canvas. And we got some donated furniture that was really rickety. And we just said, okay, strategically, we're going to start out. We're working in rec centers. We're going to start some programs that we're going to expand. We're going to work with more artists, emerging and established artists. We're going to go with the speed of light. We're going to open up our doors to all kids, not just graffiti writers, because all kids deserve access to art. And slowly, strategically, we started to build up the mural arts program. Where did you get the the skills and, and the tactical ability to make a program like this grow, right? Because it's one thing to be an artist and to have the creative side, but you've also been able to lead and grow an organization, which is, some would say, a totally different skill set altogether. I mean, my dad was a businessman. My mom was an artist. So I think I'm sort of entrepreneurial. But I also think my dad taught me a couple things. One, he always said, be humble, be gracious, be grateful. And so I feel like I'm very clear. I don't have all the answers, but I want to surround myself by really good thinkers. And I'm like a sponge and I'm always soaking up ideas. So I was always looking early on at other models around the country of public art programs. And I tried to like take from this, that, this, that, and then incorporate it into our work. I also felt as a city employee, I felt that then I feel it now highly responsible to citizens of the city. There are 53 employees at Mural Arts. Only a small fraction are city employees. Everyone here feels like a public servant working on behalf of citizens of Philly, period. That's how we feel. So I've always felt like I wake up in the day, in the morning, super grateful, super charged, going out, trying to make change happen. How do you move the needle? And I'm opportunistic. So any opportunity that would come our way, I would mine and try to grow and go, go, go. And then we would see like good results. So then we thought, oh, it's our responsibility to be highly strategic, to build on it, to leverage it. And so we started leveraging private dollars with public dollars. And then fast forward, then John Street becomes the mayor and Estelle Richmond is his director of social services. She loves mural arts. She calls us in. She goes, now I'm making you part of the managing director's office and you're part of the social service division. And suddenly I'd be at the table with these big commissioners from who are big thinkers and visionaries and have big budgets. And within a year, this is between like 2002 and 2003, we started working with the Department of Human Services, Department of Behavioral Health, Department of Prisons. And I would tell you, our budget quadrupled between 2002 and 2005. So let's back it up a little bit. It was in, it was in the late 90s. It was shortly after Mural Arts was founded that you won the Philadelphia Award. I know, shocking. I thought they had the wrong number. <laughs> yeah, so how did you find out that you had won? They came to talk to me. And this group of people who were very esteemed came and sat around the rickety table on the empty floor. On the empty floor. And I looked at them and they looked at me and I was like, oh, welcome. Welcome to the mural arts program. What are you doing here? (laughs) And they said, you have co-won the Philadelphia Award with Anne Darnancourt. And I was like, what? 
Like I looked at it like they could have been speaking Greek. And they were like, yes, you're, you're responsible for what, an, an evolving outdoor gallery, and she's responsible for PMA. Wow, that must have been incredible for you. It was the thrill of a lifetime. That's so great. And the keynote speaker at the Philadelphia Award was the president of the Ford Foundation. And I remember, like, she came up to me afterwards. I had spent a lot, I worked very hard on the speech. <laughs> and she said, that was a beautiful speech. I said, thank you. And she said, what is your budget? And I said, it was a couple hundred thousand dollars. And she said, you do all that work with that little budget. She gave me her card and she said, you need to come see me. And then I called her. And I remember when she called me back, like I was like in shock. And she invited us to go to the Ford Foundation in New York. Oh my God. And then they made a grant. And then the, a few years later, she came to visit us in Philadelphia. And we took her on a mural tour. The president of the Ford Foundation. My goodness. Can you know how crazy that was? I was like, oh, it was, it was such a, I was like, this is, I can't believe it. And she went, we went to Mantua, we went to Nara Square, we went to Strawberry Mansion. I took her out to, we had a new program out of Greaterford Prison. We took her there. She was like really thrilled. Now, I read that in a couple years after that, in 2003, you stopped painting. Is that correct? That is correct. When our program started to grow, I couldn't be out painting murals. I just couldn't. And so I made peace with this because I thought, you know what? I'm an okay painter, but I'm working with great painters. I can support them and design this program, and I can look at the work as a creative endeavor, and I made peace with it. You know, when my mom passed away about seven years ago, um, my dad sent me her watercolors, and I thought, oh, I'll start painting again, and I haven't, but I know someday I will. But I do feel this is a very, it's very creative, running mural arts, and I, I'm like the kind of person, I have an idea a minute, yeah. so I have to like sort of rein myself in. <laughs> you really are an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's it's great. true. It's great. So then at what moment did you realize that Mural Arts wasn't just a top tier organization in Philly, but a world class organization? Well, you know, I'm sort of a humble person. So it's like I have a hard time saying that because I worry like I'll jinx something or I feel like I'll. Right. As soon as you believe it, then, you know, then you won't work as hard to maintain it. I I like feel as though we're always learning and growing and evolving. But I I have to say, you know, under, under John Street, I started to feel we are really becoming something solid where our sweet spot is really that intersection of public art making and social issues, right? And civic issues. Like we are sort of that, we sit in that nexus of the public, the private, the social, the civic, and the aesthetic. And that is a really interesting place to inhabit. And I think what's very interesting is that during those years, people would say, are you in our program? Are you education? Are you social services? And then suddenly over the last five years, there's been a huge advent of this whole world of art and social practice. So you can study it at the at a museum. You can study it in many major um, academic institutions and art schools in this country. A reporter from the New York Times said this to me about five years ago. He said, Jane, you were like the original social practice artist. And I believe that. So the fact that we sit in an area that merges many disciplines has really become like what seemed maybe strange years and years ago is now not only accepted, it's sort of a practice, right? So I feel that I started feeling we're on to something under John Street and under uh, former Mayor Nutter. I felt like we started to come into our own with public art projects, like big, complicated projects and started bringing in artists from all over the world, quite frankly, like growing our practice as if we were a museum. And having a real diversity of practice as well, like working with artists and doing a live radio play or working with dancers or writers or poets. And then we started over the last number of years really building our programmatic work, our porch light work, where we work with the Department of Behavioral Health, our criminal justice work, art education work, where we serve 2,000 kids every year, and our mural making and then public art and civic engagement and restorations. Yeah. So it's interesting to see how it's grown in depth and breadth and practice. Yeah. So now other cities across the world are looking to Philadelphia. Yes, they are. And we formed a mural arts institute last year, and, okay. a formal institute where we're building capacity in other cities. And right now we're working in Detroit, Akron, and Memphis. Are those the cities that excite you most about their potential when it comes to murals? The Knight Foundation built a cohort of cities around public space work And so that's how we picked those cities. But they are doing really interesting work and they have interesting challenges. And we're very clear, like we don't want to be in Detroit as the mural arts program Detroit, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like what we want to do is build capacity with other organizations so that they can take the torch and run with it in Detroit. I also feel like the Institute is set up for 
um, knowledge sharing. So I want to know what's really cool and interesting going on in Detroit that we can learn from. So every year we have a symposium with the other cities. And we also have something called Mural Lab where we bring in interesting speakers from around the country. Because I want us to be an organization that is always hungry, hungry to learn more, hungry to evolve, eager to do more, to be better, to to make a greater impact. And the only way you do that is by being open to learning. Yeah. So murals are a wonderful expression of social issues, of a united community. However, sometimes they can be a little controversial. Mm -hmm. And you've said before that murals are a lightning rod. Yes, they can be a lightning rod for other issues. That's correct. You can often be a target of frustration, right? When when people and organizations disagree with aspects of a mural, things like that. Has that have you experienced that? Sure. I mean, I mean, I might as well talk about this directly. You know, the mural we did of, of former mayor Frank Rizzo that we did when we were the anti-graffiti network. So I want to be really clear with your listeners that that was not a mural arts project and it was not my decision. I respectfully disagreed with Tim Spencer that we should not have done that. But I was working for him and I had great respect for him. And so we did it. We had just done a portrait of Wilson Good, and we got a huge petition from people who wanted a Frank Rizzo mural. It has become even more contentious over the years. We're an organization that is part public, part private. We can't pick and choose sometimes which side we're listening to, even if we're very empathetic with one side or the other. Now, I would have preferred that this mural go away and we do a mural that is about the market now, the Ninth Street Market. Like that would be great because it's sort of like the UN down there. And also I think murals, they live for a period of time and they're loved or not loved and then they go away and you document it really well and then it changes to something else. And that community has changed. But the people who own the building and the lot and the artist want it to stay. That's a legal issue. If uh, we tried to do something, we'd be trespassing, and I have to respect that. In the end, we went on a listening tour, and we listened to people who wanted it gone, and we listened to people who wanted it to stay. And it was sort of a humbling experience, to be honest, to listen. It's not done a lot today, right? So we try to approach our work with humility. And so listening to people who love Frank Rizzo and people who completely thought this is inappropriate, it shouldn't be there, Frank Rizzo was not a good person, Like we heard the spectrum and it was one of the things that we didn't know what to do, you know, and we suggested a variety of things that were all, you know, nobody, everyone wanted to hear themselves. And in the end, you know, we had to just defer to the the people that own the building and the land. It hasn't happened recently, but there used to be a time maybe 10 years ago when people would say, why isn't the work you do more political? Well, I actually would push back on that and say, I actually think the work we do is pretty political because it's led to some profound change. And that to me is politics, right? It's about what is politics? What is political? What does that mean, right? I mean, you could do a very volatile image and did it lead to anything or not? I mean, was did it build awareness? Did Were you able to convert people who didn't think that way? Were you able to build a, a wider sort of audience? Were people able to listen to each other or come together? To me, when we do that with projects, When we're able to sort of bridge those divides that are so apparent in our society, that to me is total victory. So for you personally, what has been the biggest challenge in this organization gaining the momentum and size that it has over the years? Well, I would say fundraising is always a challenge because it's there's so many nonprofits and it's competitive and there are many people doing great things. And sometimes you're competing against your colleagues who you love and respect. But it's like the community of philanthropy in Philadelphia is, you know, it is what it is, right? So you just have to be really cognizant of always making a good case, doing excellent work, making sure you have data, telling your story well, so people understand what you're doing, why you're doing it. So that's a relentless path, right? It's relentless and you have to be incredibly tenacious and be undaunted because it's very easy to get discouraged. I mean, certainly I have at times, but then something happens that's inspiring. So fundraising, is a challenge, you know, managing a staff of 53 people and thousands of constituents and all these artists. I mean, that's like every day. And you're working in public space. Like I talked about the complexity of the Rizzo mural, or I could tell, tell you about some other projects that were divisive. And, you know, like I say, it's a lightning rod. Other issues came to the fore, but, but believe it or not, we've done well over 4,000 works of art since 1984, well over 4,000, 90% of our projects have worked out. So I, at the end of the day, 
I think what keeps me going is that I see the inherent complexity of our city and the struggle, but I also see the beauty and the resilience and the grit and the hunger for art and equity. And that is wonderful. Yeah, that's incredible. So have you ever considered stopping or leaving? Yeah. I mean, every once in a while I think, oh, I should run for city council. Like I'd like to do that. And sometimes, you know, I think, oh, I should, should do something different. I was recruited for a job in Portland, Oregon. Um, but then when I got there and spent the day being interviewed by 60 people, I was like, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> but then they were, they, there was a tie and they couldn't make a decision on who they wanted. And I was actually relieved because I didn't think I really wanted yeah. it because I love, I love it here. You know, I think in a few years I'll rethink that, you know, I know I'm not getting younger, although I feel pretty youthful. Um, I have a ton of energy, but you know, maybe I would teach. I teach, I do teach. I, I teach at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm an adjunct professor there. I'm an adjunct at Moore College of Art. And I love that. And, uh, you know, probably consult with other cities. I find that very challenging and exciting and interesting. But right now I'm pretty rooted to Philly. I really love it here. And quite honestly, to be in a position where you can take risks and do deeper programs, it takes a long time. These things don't happen overnight. If you do your work well, if you do your work with integrity, you have to sort of be a long distance runner. I mean, because none of these things are easy. The challenges that we deal with in Kensington or, you know, around all the other issues, that big criminal justice program that we have where we work in prisons, we work with people coming home, this is complicated work. And at the end of the day, we want to treat people with dignity, give people, you know, the dignity and respect that they truly deserve. And so I feel like we're at a place where we're really digging in and I'd love to give it you know, some more time uh, to see where we can go and to give the Institute time to really expand. Right. So looking back at what almost, if not 30 years Mm -hmm. working on this, what would you say so far is the most triumphant moment that you've had? If you could pick one. I think that for me, a triumphant moment is, I mean, there've been so many of them, but I think if I work backwards, I would think that this fall, standing in front of the Art for Justice public art project that wraps around MSB and hearing the two artists who had been incarcerated talk about what it meant to get out and be with the mural arts program and see mural arts as a real platform for change and knowing that these two artists are rapidly becoming really well-known, like really, and I mean like nationally, internationally well-known, that it makes me feel like we have to always be cognizant of our ability to be like a, this like sort of foundation for people to use as a springboard to sort of jump in yeah. to the unknown sometimes. I think that I feel every time we have a scholarship dinner in the spring and I hear the young people speak so eloquently about the impact of art on their lives, it makes me feel like this is a victory. And sometimes really when I'm at a mural dedication, I feel like, I mean, it just makes my heart sing. I was at this event last night and heard a woman speak, a young woman talk about her dad was a big fan of the Negro League and that he talked about the Negro League. There's a a mural about the Negro League, the Philadelphia Stars at 40th and Belmont. It's a beautiful mural. And she said it was, every time she was in the car with her dad, she felt like that's where he's headed to look at that mural. Like it became part of their life, you know? And I hear things like that all the time like how much murals have meant to people as being truly the autobiography of the city of Philadelphia. And it hasn't lost its impact on you. No. That's beautiful. No. I keep those words, the words of people really close to my heart. And when I encounter struggle or it's difficult, I think about that. Or inevitably something happens during the course of every week that is inspiring and uplifting and enriching. And I go, oh my God, I am the luckiest person in the world to have this job. So I have a few questions that I ask all my guests just to get different perspectives. What would you say is a common misconception about you? Oh, I would say that people might think that I, like I'm so tenacious and driven that I don't spend any time like sort of, I'll call it smelling the roses. Like, and I think that I have nieces and nephews and a wonderful husband and pets and love to read. And I'd like to you know, uh, hike and go bike ride. Like I have like this other side. You have a life. (laughs) Yeah, and friends. So it's like, I think there's this misconception that I just am like work 24 hours a day. I am a very, very hard worker and I'm really tenacious for sure. 
But strangely, I do have some balance in my life. Well, <laughs> but know, I think that's something people don't see. <laughs> no, I mean, as we've been going through this discussion, I mean, that is something pr- very pervasive in any media pieces that have been done about you is that you're you're a sprinter, right? So as I sort of heard your perspective about treating it like a marathon, I kind of started to see that that sort of conception that's out there isn't true. So I definitely, yeah. definitely hear that. Oh, also, I think people might think too that I, like, I'm so tenacious and like I'm trying to make a point all the time that maybe I don't hear the other side but I'm actually like really hear the other side because the work of working in communities is all about hearing the other side. If you could send a message to yourself in the past at any point butterfly effect aside so you know you wouldn't lose anything nothing would really change what would you say? I probably would say in the early years of mural arts that it wasn't about the quantity of the work. It was about the quality because I think I spent a number of years thinking that we needed to create thousands of projects in order to be excellent. And then I got it that it was the quality of the work and the program that meant Mm, excellence. What would you say is the biggest challenge facing Philadelphia today? I think it's our intractable rate of poverty. I think that is a tough one. And I admire our mayor a lot, and I think he's really trying, and there are a lot of good people in the administration doing really good things. But it is a statistic that the city has to grapple with. I mean, I think that we are, but it's we have a mayor who's introducing innovative things, but this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. What excites you most about Philadelphia today? Oh, I think that the abundance of young people that I'm meeting all the time who have a developed, um, very sort of profound social conscience that I think care about the city. I feel that they're, you know, really, they're a future and they're going to carry that torch and I want them to do it well. That excites me. I see the sort of abundance of arts and cultural organization from dance to theater to spoken word to the visual arts. And I find that incredibly exciting. And You know, as always, I think that there is, we gentrify and change in Philly, but we have a scrappiness and a grit that I hope we never lose. Yeah. Finally, if you could get one message to every single Philadelphian, whether a tweet, an email, a giant mural, it's one message that every Philadelphian could receive and ponder. I would want to say that we, there are two things I would do, but I, I mean, first, I really would like to encourage people to hold on to the word empathy. I think it's really missing in our society. And I think that when I see real light come through in our projects, it's because somehow something has shifted. I think one of the hardest things for human beings to do is to understand another person's perspective. And someone once said, a theology professor, that when that happens, one enters into a state of grace. And I think the message that I would like to say to everybody is that we want to be in that state of grace. And that means embracing empathy. For more on Jane and mural arts, you can head to podphillyhoo.com forward slash murals. That's M-U-R-A-L-S. Or just check out the show notes. As always, make sure you're subscribed and have given a rating on Apple Podcasts and have told at least one friend about how much you love Philly Who. It really is a huge help. Also, be sure to follow on Twitter and Instagram at Pod Philly Who for extra content and discussion. Philly Who is a Q9 production with editing by Max Graham, original music by Lee Rosevere, and artwork by Lauren Carhart. Special thanks to Alex Feldman and Caitlin Butler. I'm your host, Kevin Schmidlin. See you next week.